Hello and welcome to this first look exploring session looking at Patient Grisel by Thomas Decker, Henry Chettle and William Horton uh, produced by the Admiral's Men at the Rose uh, in February 1600 which I suppose means it's technically still 1599 uh, but never mind it's fine don't worry about it um, this is three uh, this play will be done over three sessions and is not to be confused with the earlier patient Grizel that we have done uh, by a different author this is, say, is a playhouse play rather than the earlier one which is more a bit more interlude -y. Um, um which let's be honest the, the previous one went down like a ton of sick so let's see whether this one improves on that uh, that opinion of this particular story i think just generally warn you ahead it, it's not a nice story patient grisel you may have some some serious objections to it so you know content warning this is a husband who's going to be really really quite bad to his wife so um yeah there might be some some trouble ahead just uh, to be forewarned there to uh, work our way through the first third of the play to see whether these three authors uh, dance their way through this uh, this uh, this story uh, with uh, any level of finesse uh, reading the marquis and Fernese is uh, lois potter in london uh, reading Pavia, reese uh, yes because there's random welsh people and furio is Hi, I'm Eric, and I'm not Welsh, so I apologise in advance. I was I was Welsh last week, apparently, but uh, and I I'm not at all. Yes, uh, all parts are assigned randomly, regardless of uh, uh, your individual level of Welshness. Uh, reading uh, uh, Grisel and Emulo is. Hi, my name's Elizabeth Amisu, and I'm an author still based in Romford. Uh, reading Babulo, Sir Owen, uh, and Onofrio is... Hello, I'm Lynn Freitas. Uh, I'm a teacher in the Northwestern United States, and I am neither Welsh nor funny. So we'll see how this Babulo thing goes. Uh, reading Lepido, Lorio, uh, Gwenethian, and Julia is... Alan, based in Suffolk, lots of experience in dodging harpoon. <laughs> and I'm your host, Robert Christ, and I'll be reading stage directions. I'll also read Mario, uh, Janiculo, and Uscenze, and we'll see how that all goes. That's quite a lot of quite cramped doubling. We shall see how this goes. So, uh, without further ado, let's dive into Act 1, Scene 1. Enter the Marquis, Pavia, Mario, Lepido, and Huntsman. All are like Huntsman, and there is a noise of horns within. <laughs> Look you so strange, my heart, to see our limbs thus suited in a hunter's livery. Oh, tis a lovely habit when green youth, like to the flowery blossom of the spring, conforms his outward habit to his mind. Look how yon one-eyed wagoner of heaven hath by his horse's fiery winged hoofs burst ope the melancholy jail of night, and with his gilt beams cunning alchemy turned all these clouds to gold, who with the winds upon their misty souled shoulders bring in day. Then sully not this morning with foul looks, but teach your jocund spirits to ply the chase, for hunting is a sport for emperors. We know it is, and therefore do not throw on these your pastimes a contracted brow. How swift youth's bias runs to catch delights to me is not unknown. Brother Walter, when you were wooed by us to choose a wife, the day you vowed to wed, but now I see your promises turn all to mockery. This day you are self-appointed to give answer to all those neighbour princes who in love offer their daughters, sisters and allies in marriage to your hand. Yet for all this, the hour being come that calls you to your choice, you stand prepared for sport and start aside to hunt poor deer when you should seek a bride. <laughs> Nay, come, Mario, your opinion too. He had need of ten men's wit that goes to woo. First satisfy these princes who expect your gracious answer to their embassies. Then may you freely revel. Now you fly both from your own vows and their amity. How much your judgments are. Who gets a wife must, like a huntsman, beat untrodden paths to gain the flying presence of his love. 
Look how the yelping beagles spend their mouths. So lovers do their sighs. And as the deer outstrips the active hound and oft turns back to note the angry visage of her foe, who greedy to possess so sweet a prey never gives over till he sees on her, so fares it with coy dames, who great with scorn fly the care-pined hearts that sue to them. Yet on that feigned flight, love conquering them, they cast an eye of longing back again, as who would say, be not dismayed with frowns, for though our tongues speak no, our hearts sound yea. Or, if not so, before they'll miss their lovers, their sweet breaths shall perfume the amorous air and brave them still to run in beauty's chase. Then can you blame me to be hunter-like when I must get a wife? But be content, so you'll engage your faith by oath to us. Your wills shall answer mine, my liking yours, and that no wrinkle on your cheeks shall ride. This day the Marquis vows to choose a bride. Even by my honor. Uh, brother, be advised, uh, the importunity of you and these thrusts my free thoughts into the yoke of love to groan under the load of marriage. Since then you throw this burden on my youth, swear to me whomsoever my fancy choose of what descent, beauty, or birth she be, her you shall like and love as you love me. Now by my birth I swear wed whom you please and I'll embrace her with the brother's arm. Mario and myself, your fair choice, shall yield all duties and true reverence. <laughs> your protestations please me jollily. Let's ring a hunter's peal, and in the ears of our swift forest citizens proclaim defiance to their lightness. Our sport's done, the venison that we kill shall feast our bride. If she proves bad, I'll cast all blame on you. Uh, but if sweet peace succeed this amorous strife, I'll say my wit was best to choose a wife. And they exit, and as they go in, horns sound. <laughs> and there's hallooing within. Uh, but we'll pause there before we go into the next scene. Um, so, you know, the Marquis there, he's out hunting. His various uh, friends and family members going, "When well, you, you shouldn't be hunting, you should be finding yourself a wife. Come on, you're the Marquis, this is an important thing. <laughs> And Marquis lays down the Gordon look going, OK, look, I'll marry, but you don't get a vote as to who I choose. And everyone agrees on that. So I think that's that's the important plot points laid out. Um, Marquis yeah. has, has a way with words. He's a bit flowery. Uh, how, how are we feeling about the Marquis without thinking ahead as to who the Marquis is going to turn out to be? But from this scene, uh, you know, uh, how, how are we feeling about the Marquis? Lynn? Uh Sorry, I can't really turn off my 21st century, uh, you know, developed country female way of being in the world. And this whole, they say no, but they really mean yes, it's so <laughs> toxic. And it's just really hard for me to, to be comfortable with that. How do you say no then? If no means yes, how do you actually say no when you mean no? And he's just like, ha ha ha. They they say no when they just mean try harder. Sorry. Yeah, he's 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 uh, he's they're, they're, they're not necessarily endearing themselves to us. Um, uh, other thoughts. Um, very, I say very florid language for the the Marquis. I found it, it, it was all very heightened from everybody to a degree. I mean, even Mario, who only had four lines, I thought, oh, ooh, gonna work work this verse reasonably reasonably sensibly. Um, yeah, there's, there's there's versifying going on here. Uh, any other thoughts at this stage? This short introductory scene, I think it lays down the marker of we know what the plot is. Mm. We know where we're going. But then if you turn up to Patient Grizel and you don't know where you're going, then you've probably turned up to the wrong place. Um, <laughs> really need to know the 
what you're getting into. Anyway, let's go on then with Act 1, Scene 2. Uh, as already stated, the horns have sounded and hallooing within for the exit of the previous scene. That done, enter Genculo, Grizel and Bebulo with two baskets begun to be wrought. Old master, here's a morning able to make us work tooth and nail. Merry then, we must have vittles. The sun hath played Bo Peep in the element any time these two hours, as I do some mornings when you call, What, Fabulo? say you. Here, master, say I. And then this eye opens, yet Don is the mouse. Lie still. What, Fabulo? says Grisel. Anon, say I, and then this eye looks up, yet down I snug again. What, Fabulo, you say again, and then I start up and see the sun, and then sneeze, and then shake my ears, and then rise, and then get my breakfast, and then fall to work, and then wash my hands, and by this time, I am ready. Here's your basket, and Griselle, here's yours. Fetch thine own, Fabulo, let's ply our business. Oh, God send me good luck, master. Why, Babulo? What's the matter? Oh, well, God forgive me. I think I shall not eat a peck of salt. I shall not live long. Sure, I should be a rich man by right. And they never do good deeds, but when they see, they must die. And I have now a monstrous stomach to work. Because I think I shall not live long. Go, fool. Cease this vain talk and fall to work. I'll hamper somebody if I die, because I am a basket maker. And exit Babulo. Come, Grizel, work, sweet girl. Here the warm sun will shine on us, and when his fires begin, we'll cool our sweating brows in yonder shade. Father, methinks it doth not fit a maid, by sitting thus in view, to draw men's eyes to stare upon her. Might it please your age, I could be more content to work within? Indeed, my child, men's eyes do nowadays quickly take fire at the least spark of beauty, and if those flames be quenched by chaste disdain, then their envenomed tongues, alack, do strike to wound her fame, whose beauty they did like. I will avoid their darts and work within. Hmm. Thou needst not. In a painted coat goes sin, and loves those that love pride. None looks on thee, then keep me company. How much unlike are thy desires to many of thy sex? How many wantons lie in Sir Lucia frown like the sullen night when their fair faces are hid within doors, but got once abroad like the proud sun they spread their staring beams. They shine out to be seen, their loose eyes tell that in their bosoms wantonness doth dwell. Thou canst not do so, Grizel, for thy son is but a star. Thy star a spark of fire, which hath no power to inflame doting desire. Thy silks are threadbare russets, all thy portion is but an honest name. That done, that gone, thou art dead. O oh, dead thou livest, that being unblemished. If to die free from shame be ne'er to die, then I'll be crowned with immortality. Pray God thou mayest. Yet, child, my jealous soul trembles through fears, so often as my mine eyes see our duke court thee, and when to thine ears he tunes sweet love songs, oh, beware, my Grisel, he can prepare his way with gifts of gold. Upon his breath winged promotion flies, oh, my dear girl, trust not his sorceries. Did he not seek the shipwreck of thy fame? Why should he send his tailors to take measure of Grisel's body? But as one should say, if thou wilt be the Marquis Concubine, thou shalt wear rich attires. But they that think with costly garments sins black-faced to hide, wear naked bravery and ragged pride. Good father, do not shake your age with fears. Although the Marcus, Marcus sometimes visit us, yet all his words and deeds are like his birth, steeped in true honour, but admit they were not. Before my soul looked black with speckled sin, my hand shall make me pale death's underling. The music of those words sweeten mine ears. Come, girl, let's fast to work. Time apace wears. And re-enter Babulo with his work. Come, Babulo, 
Why hast thou stayed so long? Nay, why are you so short? Master, here's money I took since I went for a cradle. This year, I think we leap year, for women do nothing but buy cradles. By my troth, I think the world is at an end, for as soon as we be born, we marry. As soon as we marry, we get children. By hook or by crook, gotten they are. Children must have cradles, and soon as they are in them, they hop out of them. For I have seen little girls that yesterday had scarce a hand to make them ready, the next day had worn wedding rings on their fingers, so that if the world do not end, we shall not live by one another. Basket making, as of all other trades, as all other trades, runs to decay, and shortly we shall not be worth a button. For none in this cutting age so true stitches but tailors and shoemakers, and yet now and then they tread their shoes awry too. Let not thy tongue go so. Sit down to work, and that our labour may not seem so long. We'll cunningly beguile it with a song. Do, master, for that's honest cousinage. We don't know precisely how the song breaks down, but we're just going to hand it all to Babylon to, to, to say, sing, uh, as, as you so please. Art thou poor, yet thou hast golden slumbers. O oh, sweet content, art thou rich, yet thy mind perplexed. O oh, punishment, dost thou laugh to see how fools are vexed to add to golden numbers, golden numbers? O oh, sweet content, la 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 la. <laughs> Work apace, 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 honest labour bears a lovely face. Yet hey, nanny, nanny, hey, nanny, nanny, canst drink the waters of the crisped spring, O oh, sweet content. Swimmest thou in wealth, yet sinkest in thine own tears, O oh, punishment. Then he that, ha that patiently wants burdens bear, no burden bears but a king, a king, O oh, sweet content, la 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 la, Work a pace, a pace, a pace, a pace. Etc. Etc. So there's lots of <laughs> angles and uh, re repetitions probably going on within the, the, those those relatively uh, outline uh, of stuff. Before this scene continues, I think we should just unpack some of the stuff going on here because I felt distinctly uncomfortable reading Genkulo the further he went on because I was thinking, oh, it's Father ch ch Chap um, telling Babulo to get on with his work. I liked Babulo when he uh, there's, there's something quite nice about his sort of explaining how he gets up in the morning and you know he clearly never wants to do any work and he's <laughs> constantly being told by his master to get on and do some work and i was quite liking that and then uh, janiculo starts talking to his daughter and there are several problems with what he's saying there uh we have a uh, slightly rated racist beauty standard at play through a lot of his uh, his descriptions of uh, the nature of beauty um and also yeah, well, I mean, he does sort of go, well, you know, we should keep you out of sight because men are terrible um, and, and think, yeah, there's lots, there's lots of issues here. Um, mm. He's being protective in, in a reasonable way at times, and then he's also being protective in a sort of way. That, uh, it's reasonable for the time, perhaps. But anyway, uh, thoughts on the room, Lynn? Yeah, completely. Yeah. Aside from the obvious, like, oh, you're not worth anything if you're not chasing. Yeah. Mm. Um, <laughs> Uh, but I was thinking in the first scene that the, the, the Mark was saying, okay, you tell me I got to get married, I'll, I'll get married. But the deal is you have to accept who I pick, N no matter who she is, no objections. You have to promise to, to embrace her, whoever she is. I got the feeling like he's already picked. He's already, no he already knows who he's, who he wants. And he knows that his family and his courtiers would, would disapprove. So he's kind of heading that off. And it turns out that, that that looks like that's the situation because he's been courting Griselle already, we find. So so he's kind of manipulating the situation there in the first scene as well. Mm, yes, I mean, in story term, you know, plot terms, this this is laying out the plot very, very clearly. You know, we have the Marquis, he has to get married, hints of, uh, you know, uh, that he might be picking someone that other people don't like. Um, we then meet uh, Griselle. Griselle has been uh, measured up uh, effectively for for um, by by the Marquis, and we have that, and the father's um, suggesting that he's not that keen on that 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 where that's going. Um, so yeah, story wise, this is it's laying out the characters, it's it's setting all these things up. It just has this sort of underlying problem that we 
I may or may not find a solution to. Uh, Lois. Yeah, the, the only thing I found slightly inconsistent is that uh, uh, to begin with, Griselda says that she doesn't want to be uh, sitting there where everybody can see her and her father tells her that she doesn't need to worry because she's so shabbily dressed that nobody's going to look at her. Then he suddenly starts telling her that uh, the Marquis, in fact, has been there a lot and has been courting her and has measured her. And uh, it's, it sounds like a totally different situation. Uh, I mean, if nobody's going to look at her, then what is all this about? Uh, I mean, I don't really see the point of his first comments. Um, it's more like a general point, I guess, about how you know virtuous uh, poor people are not noticed and uh, uh, which rich people are, but it's got nothing to do with what's happening. Um, the other thing is, I think is rather interesting is that they're basket makers. Uh, and uh, uh, that's partly, I think, because this was something relatively easy to do on the stage. I mean, they come on with baskets that are already partly made and then they can do some more work on them and look as if they're doing something, but also because um, it's one of the things I discovered actually from the Wiggins catalog. I mean, the uh, baskets and uh, uh, basket making were, were quite important for the drama because they did use uh, uh, the, the, that the sort of woven uh, stuff for uh, quite a lot of props. So they probably would have had this kind of material around. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah, it's it's good prop business. It's uh, sort of uh, before you r start writing plays with uh, drinks cabinets so that the actors have something to do. Um, this this is perhaps the the early modern equivalent. Uh, uh, Eric then Lynn. I, I was going to say that it reminded me a bit of the, the whole sort of setup of Shoemaker's Holiday. The, the part that is actually irrelevant to the plot where you've got sort of Jane um, and Ra Rafe uh, sort of obviously before the marriage kind of thing and she's got to go off and work and uh, she's, she, there's this whole sequence about how she kind of wants to keep herself out of out of sight uh, among women or something so, something like that um if i remember correctly because uh, <laughs> um, she wants to be tr you know true to him um and also there was another bit that uh, basically bad, bad remind me a bit of uh, a mixture of bunch from weakest goes to the wait no weakest goes to the wall and Ferk from shoemaker's holiday again <laughs> who basically didn't want to do any work mm. Mm, yes this 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 constant refrain of you know uh working people and how much work the working people actually want to do and the, <laughs> their working rhythms um and all of these plays are coming from pretty much on top of each other and with pretty much the same authors as well so you get that they're working through a theme here um uh, I, I, this is something that's interesting to this moment uh lynn yeah ba the baskets would have been a really common item one would think in the, in an ordinary household relatively inexpensive uh lightweight you know we have materials now that they didn't have access to so like willow with willow baskets would have been everywhere probably. Um, so in response to um, Lois's meditation on like, what is the father up to here? Like uh, like exposing her to, to, to public view and chastising her about now, now you and the Marquis, what's going on with you? I, we might be, that might be thematic rather than character based. Mm -hmm. We're introducing that theme of sort of testing here she is in, in, in public making her a temptation because she's obviously very pretty, even though she's modestly or poorly dressed. So maybe that's what's what's going on. Mm. Uh, any other thoughts yeah. before we move on and complete the scene? So we've had a lovely sing song uh, working away on our baskets, done a bit of weaving, competitive weaving on stage. Uh, <laughs> enter Lorio. Weep, master, yonder comes your son. Lorio, my son, oh heaven, let thy rich band pour plenteous showers of blessing on his head. Trouble the number fall on, upon your age. Sister! Dear brother Lorio, welcome home. Master Lorio, Janiculo's son, welcome home. How do the nine muses Pride, covetous envy, sloth, wrath, let me and lechery. You that are scholars, read how they do. Muses, these fool of the seven deadly sins. Are they? Mass me thinks it's better serving them than your nine muses, for they are stark beggars. 
Often I have wished to see you here. It grieves me that you see me here so soon. Why, Lorio, dost thou grieve to see thy father, or dost thou scorn me for my poverty? He needs not, for he looks like poor John himself. Eight to a neck of mutton is not that your commons and the queue of bread. Father, I grieve my young years to your age should add more sorrow. Why, son, what's the matter? That which to think on makes me desperate. I, that have charged my friends, and from my father, pulled more than he could spare, I, that have lived these nine years at the university, must now, for this world's devil, this angel of gold, have all those days and nights to beggary sold, through want of money, what I want, I miss. Who is more scorned than a poor scholar is? Yes, three things. Age, wisdom, and basket makers. Brother, what mean these words? Oh, I'm mad to think how much a scholar undergoes and in the end reaps naught but penury. Father, I'm enforced to leave my book because the study of my book doth leave me in the lean arms of wank necessity, having no shelter. Ah, oh, me, but to fly into the sanctuary of your aged arms. A trade, a trade I follow basket making. Leave books and turn blockhead. Peace, fool. Welcome, my son. Though I am poor, my love shall not be so. Go, daughter Grisel, fetch water from the spring to seethe our fish, which yesterday I caught. The cheer is mean, but be content. When I have sold these baskets, the money shall be spent to bid thee welcome. Grisel, make haste, run and kindle fire. Exit Grisel. Go, Grisel, I'll make fire and scour the kettle. It's a hard world when scholars eat fish upon flesh days. Exit Babulo. It's not a shame for me that I'm a man, nay more, a scholar, to endure such need that I must prey on him whom I should feed. Nay, grieve not, son. Better have felt worse woe. Come sit by me while I work to get bread. And Grisel, spin us yarn to clothe our backs. Thou shalt read doctrine to us for the soul. Then what shall we three want? Nothing, my son, for when we cease from work, even in that while, my song shall charm grief's ears and care beguile. Re-enter Grissel, we're running with a pitcher. Father, as I was running to fetch water, I saw the Marquess with a gallant train come riding towards us. Oh, see where they come. Into the Marquess, Pavio, Mario, Lepido, two ladies and some other attendants. See where my Grissel and her father is. Methinks her beauty shining through these weeds seems like a bright star in the sullen night. How lovely poverty dwells on her back. Did but the proud world note her as I do, she would cast off rich robes, forswear rich state, to clothe them in such poor habiliments. Father, a good fortune ever bless thine age. All happiness attend, my gracious lord. And what wish you, fair maid? That your thoughts to your contentment <laughs> may be satisfied. Thou wouldst wish so, newst thou, for what I come. A brother of Pavia, behold this virgin. Mario, Lepido, is she not fair? Brother, I have not seen so mean a creature so full of beauty. Were but Grissel's birth as worthy as her form, she might be held a fit companion for the greatest state. Oh, blindness, so that men may beauty find. They ne'er respect the beauties of the mind. Uh, Father Janiculo, uh, what's he that speaks? Oh, a poor, despised scholar, and my son. Ah, uh, this is no time to hold dispute with scholars. Uh, tell me in faith, old man, what dost thou think because the Marquis visits thee so oft? The will of princes, subjects must not search. Let it suffice, your grace is welcome here. And I'll requite that welcome if I live. Grissel, suppose a man should love you dearly, as I know some that do. Would you agree to quittance true affection with the like? None is so fond to fancy poverty. 
I say there is. Come, lords, stand by my side. Now, brother, you are sped and have a wife. Then give us leave that are all bachelors. Now, Grissel, I us well and give your verdict. Which of us three you hold the properest man? I have no skill to judge proportions. Nay, then you jest. Women have eagle's eyes to pry even to the heart. And why not you? Come, we stand fairly. Freely speak your mind. For by my birth, he whom thy choice shall bless shall be thy husband. What intends your grace? Lord, I have vowed to live a single life. A single life. This cunning cannot serve. Do not I know you love her? I've heard your passions spent for her, your sighs for her. Mario, to the wonder of her beauty, compiled a sonnet. I, my lord, write sonnets. Uh, you did entreat me to entreat her father that you might have his daughter to your wife. To anyone I willingly resign all interest in her which doth look like mine. My lord, I swear she'll ne'er be, she ne'er shall be my bride. I hope she'll swear so too, being thus denied. Both of you turned apostates in love. Nay, then, I'll play the crier. Once, twice, thrice, speak, or she's gone. No? Since twill not be, since you are not for her, yet she's for me. What mean you, brother? Faith, no more but this, by love's most wondrous metamorphosis, to turn this maid into your brother's wife. Nay, sweetheart, look not strange, I do not jest, but to thine ears mine amorous thoughts impart. Walter protests he loves you with his heart. The admiration of such happiness makes me astonished. Oh, my gracious lord, humble not your high state to my low birth, who am not worthy to be held your slave, much less your wife. Ah, Grissel, that shall suffice. I count thee worthy. Old Janiculo, art thou content that I shall be thy son? I am unworthy of so great a good. Tash, tash, talk not of worth. In honest terms, tell me if I shall have her. For by heaven, unless your free consent allow my choice to win ten kingdoms, I'll not call her mine. Um, what's thy son's name? Uh, Lorio, my gracious lord. Uh, I'll have both your consents. Um, I tell ye, lords, I have wooed the virgin long. Oh, many an hour have I been glad to steal from all your eyes to come disguised to her. I swear to you, beauty first made me love and virtue woo. I loved her lowliness, but when I tried what virtues were entempled in her breast, my chaste heart swore that she should be my bride. Say, father, uh, must I be forsworn or no? What to my lord seems best, me seems so. Uh, Lorio, uh, what's your opinion? Lorio? This, my lord, if equal thoughts does both your states confer, hers is too low, and you too high for her. Hmm, what says fair Gristle now? This doth she say, as her old father yields to your dread will, so she her father's pleasure must fulfil. If old Janiculo make Grissel yours, Grissel must not deny, yet had she rather be the poor daughter still of her poor father. I'll gild that poverty and make it shine with beams of dignity. This base attire these ladies shall tear off and deck thy beauty in robes of honor that the world may say virtue and beauty was my bride today. This mean choice will disdain your nobleness. No more, Mario. <laughs> then it doth disgrace the sun to shine on me. She's poor and base. She's rich, for virtue beautifies her face. What will the world say when the trump of fame shall sound your high breath with the beggar's name? The world still looks a squint, and I deride his purblind judgment. Grissel is my bride. Janiculo and Lorio, father, brother, uh, you and your son, 
graced with our royal favor, shall live to outwear time in happiness. Re-enter Babulo. Master, I have made a good fire. Sir Gristle, the fish. Fall on thy knees, thou fool. See, here's the duke. I have not offended him. Therefore, I'll not duck any were ten dukes. I'll kneel to none but God and my prince. This is thy prince. Be silent, Babylon. Silence is a virtue. Mary, tis a dumb virtue. I love virtue that speaks and has a long tongue like a bellwether to lead other virtues after it. If he be a prince, I hope he is not prince over my tongue. Snails, wherefore come all these? Master, here's not fish enough for us. Sarah Gristle, the fire burns out. <laughs> Tell me, my love, what pleasant fellow is this? My aged father's servant, my gracious lord. How? My... My love, I master, a word to the wise. Solicit me my love. Uh, what's his name? Babulo, sir, is my name. Why dost thou tremble so? We are all thy friends. Well, it's hard, sir, for this motley jerkin to find friendship with this fine doublet. Janicula, bring him to court with thee. You may be ashamed to lay such knavish burden upon old age's shoulders, but I see they are stooping a little. All cry down for him, with him. He shall not bring me, sir. I'll carry myself. I pray thee do. I'll have thee live at court. Oh, I have a better trade, sir. Basket making. Hmm, Gristle, I like thy man's simplicity. Still shall he be thy servant. Babulo, a Gristle, thy mistress, now shall be my wife. I think, sir, I am a fitter husband for her. Why shouldst thou think so? I will make her rich. That's all one, sir. Beggars are fit for beggars, gentlefolks for gentlefolks. I am afraid that this wonder of the rich loving the poor will last but nine days. Old master, bid this merry gentleman home to dinner. You shall have a good dish of fish, sir, and thank him for his goodwill to your daughter Grissel. For if I, for I'll be hanged if he do not, as many rich cogging merchants nowadays do, when they have got what they would, give her the bells and let her fly. Oh, bear, my lord, with his intemperate tongue. Oh, Grissel, I take delight to hear him talk. Aye, aye, you are best take me up for your fool, and not, uh, are not you he that came Speaking so to Grissel here, do you remember how I knocked you once for offering to have a lick at her lips? Um, I do remember it. And for thy pains, a golden recompense I'll give to thee. Hmm. Why well, do, and I'll knock you as often as you list. <laughs> uh, Grissel, this merry fellow shall be mine. Uh, but we forget ourselves, the day grows old. Come, lords, um, cheer up your looks, and with fair smiles grace our intended nuptials. Time may come when all commanding love your hearts subdue. The Marquis may perform as much for you. And they exit, end of act one. Ah, native cockney witch. <laughs> um, I like Babulo very much. Uh, he's very much the saving grace here. I just love the fact that he just comes on saying, well, the fish is on. Uh, I've got a, <laughs> water's boiling. Um, yeah, no, it's fine. I, 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 it's okay. It's uh, yeah, whoever you are. Uh, and then the, the detail at the end of, uh, you know, oh, hang on. Was I didn't I punch you in the face once for trying to kiss uh, my mistress? I'll, I'll punch you as often as you like. And frankly, I think we're all voting for that. Uh, <laughs> So yeah, Babylon enjoying a lot. Um, Marquis, less so. Um, some issues here, um, and just the way he's using some of his language. I mean, uh, even on relatively straightforward, you know, uh, when sort of saying, "Oh, we'll get you some new clothes," using this, you know, this base attire, these ladies shall tear off. I mean, it's not just "we'll get you some new clothes" when you get your your, your my affianced. We'll tear off your your, your clothing. 
And then the auction bit of just when he's going, you fancied her, didn't you, chaps? Uh, well, um, you know, uh, I, well, I fancy her. Anyone, any objections? Going once, going twice? No? Lovely. And the I, I played up the obsequiousness of the father, but he did feel ever so crawly in the way it's written. Um, I mean, it's, it's impossible to say what the author's intent uh, was, but, you know, what is this play doing or trying to do i mean you know are, are, what are we supposed to be feeling about this um uh where is it going with this i'll go to elizabeth and lois and eric yeah just to echo what you were saying rob i think one of the things that we can take away is that the characters are really really well drawn they're really rounded and i was thinking like the one character that i thought maybe wasn't as well rounded as the others was grisel herself mm. um because she's patient, Rizelle, and and obviously the patience is a virtue. Um, and then I really, I thought Lorio needed a little bit more rounding out as well. But apart from that, the Marcus, Babulo, Janiculo, they're really round, rounded characters. Um, I think that um, the the female, the feminine aspect of the of Rizelle is not really coming to the fore. I really want her to be strong. I really wanted to be kind of this strong character that kind of has an opinion and has thoughts of her own, but that's maybe not necessarily <laughs> coming to the fore here. That's not, that's not that type of play. Um, the tone, I felt, was like a city comedy. I thought it was funny. And Babula really made me laugh, but I thought that it has like an underlying tone to it that maybe everything's going to go wrong and it's all going to get quite dark quite quickly. Mm. Oh, I, I think it's no spoilers to say that, yes, that is uh, that is definitely where it's going. And uh, I mean, just talking about the sun, the Lorio, uh, there is a question there of where actually that part's going to land as well, because he's this poor scholar and he's come home asking daddy for more money, which, of course, you know, the daddy is quite happy to, you know, oh, I'll send, sell some baskets. That will solve, obviously, your student woes. Um, and uh, yeah, so it's an interesting question of, actually where that character is going to land how sincere is he or is he coming you know is he really genuinely profligate and he's just trying to get more money squeeze more cash out of his father is he genuinely repentant um he it's interesting when the marquis addresses lorio as well you know because he gives that answer you know well my daughter's probably a bit too poor and you're a bit too rich for you to go well together so it's, there's some interesting questions there actually in terms of how sketched out he'll be further down the line and what's going on there. I'll go to, I think it was Lois next, was it? And then Eric? Yeah, um, well, yeah, I thought it was just interesting that uh, uh, contradictory views were being expressed here. I mean, not just the snooty courtiers saying that, of course, she's too base for you, but uh, Lorio saying this this looks pretty doubtful and uh, uh, and uh, Grissel saying the same thing and Babulo particularly <laughs> saying that, uh, you know, this is probably a passing fancy for the rich to love the poor and it's not going to last. So watch it. Uh, I mean, it seems to me it's it's been set up, you know, much more interestingly and subtly than in previous versions. Uh, and I think the introduction of Lorio is very interesting because uh, he's obviously to some extent a malcontent, one would gather. I mean, he's I think he's left the university for good. I don't think his idea is to get more money and go back. I think he's he can't afford to stay there. Yeah, he's only been there nine years. Yeah, quite. <laughs> well, he's got at least a BA. <laughs> 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 it, it, it keeps going back and starts doing his first year again. Um, <laughs> there's always a module he hasn't quite finished. Uh, <laughs> uh, I think Eric and then Lynn. There, there was a moment where, like, I was kind of thinking that Janiculo is kind of um, very distant from his children. He's kind of like, yeah, like sort of in, in a very, um, I don't know, pre-First World War kind of way. Um, where it's kind of like, I love you, daughter, I love you, but it doesn't really, you know, it's very sort of, I don't know, maybe that's just me. Um, and just, it was interesting when Babula came in to sort of disrupt things, though he hasn't really managed to disrupt what the Marquis wants to do. Um, and it's just like sort of this trope of, it feels a bit like a morality play where you have this trope that the virtuous person has is beautiful um, externally as well. Um, and it just struck me that kind of, I, I do really want Babio to punch the Marquis again. Um, yeah. yeah. 
Yeah, we can hope. We can hope. Let's be honest. Uh, in, in the last time we did a patient Grizel, we did spend most of the time in the chat saying, "Kill the Marquis. Marquis should die." <laughs> so if this plays at least giving us the potential for random physical violence, then uh, yeah. then maybe we've we've we're we're in, on on a firm footing. Uh, Lynn, then Elizabeth. Yeah, the uh, the whole going once, going twice, going thrice. I guess you don't want to. Um, we shouldn't be thinking, in case anybody is, about whatever it is, Sotheby's or, or whoever, you know, auctioning <laughs> off rare works of art for millions of pounds. That's not that that's a, a, anachronistic. The only thing I know of that was auctioned off in open markets in this period was human beings, was enslaved human beings. So that's what that's invoking. Mm. Okay. Um, and um, uh, something completely different, you know, Elizabeth said something up about this. There's something kind of sort of ominous about, you know, things are gonna go horribly wrong. And structurally, I think that's exactly right. When you have a relationship, a potential relationship with, with, with things blocking it, um, with things to overcome uh, and you don't get that relationship to happen until the end, you've got a comedy. But when you have a marriage at the beginning, that usually signals a tragedy. And even in something like uh, Marlowe's e Edward, where, oh, Gaveston is coming back. My best friend is coming back. When you begin with a reconciliation, things can only go downhill from there. So. And then there are a couple of domestic tragedies from this period where the couple gets together early in the play and you know that there's nowhere to go but down from, from that romantic seeming resolution. So yeah, getting married at the beginning signals, oh yeah, we're gonna have some conflict. Mm. Uh, Elizabeth. Yeah, I think I really second what Lynn just said. Um, it, that conflict, I think, is definitely found in like the concept of the virtuous and the also, and the damned. Um, the, the, I like the whole thing about the muses and how um, one of the characters gets the muses wrong, and actually it's the seven deadly sins. <laughs> and I was wondering if like each of the characters in the play represents a different virtue or vice. <coughs> I mean, yeah, there's something interesting about because you know, we've mentioned the, the, the morality uh, ness of things. I mean, not that the characters are quite types because they are quite well drawn in, in an outline, but the language is so heightened for some of them. It does feel very that it's I'm not quite getting at ca the characters that there's sort of a a sort of poetic sheen that's um, keeping keeping the edge off. Even even someone like Babylo, who's in prose. Uh, or should be in prose occasionally hasn't been properly formatted um uh my bad uh so yeah i'm i'm, I'm wondering I'm, the, the, there is this problem that grisel it just there is nothing to grisel i mean i think elizabeth's point earlier was absolutely right that there's a because by the nature of the patience there's there's there's, there's no conflict that's going to come out from her um it's a shame because we, you know give her an, an interior monologue then then maybe there there is uh, a conflict that we could uh, but it's all surface um anyway we shall see there might be more data to come that will give us something else uh as we go into act two and we're going to go to a different plot line entirely which may or may not be more sympathetic to us uh, enter Farnese, uh, Chense, and Reese, meeting them running. Reese, how now, man? Whither art thou galloping? Okay, even to find the full manger, my teeth water till I be marching. I have been at the cutlers to bid him bring away Sir Owen's rapier, and I am and ambling home thus fast, for I fear I am driven to fast. But Sarah Reese, when's the day? Will not thy master, Sir Owen, and Sir Signor and Signor Emulo fight? No, for Signor Emulo has warned my master to the court of conscience, and there's an order set down that the coward shall pay my master good words weekly till the debt of his collar be run out. Excellent. But uh, did not Emulo write a challenge to Sir Owen? No, he sent a terrible one, but he. He gave the section of a church regret to write it, and he set his mark to it, but the gulk and I the right nor read. <laughs> Not write and read. Why? I have seen him pull out a bundle of sonnets, written and read them to ladies. He got them by heart, or Chenze, and so deceived the poor souls. Uh, as a gallant whom I know, cousins others, uh, for my brisk spangled baby, will come to a stationer's shop 
call for a stool and a cushion, and then asking for some Greek poet. To him, he falls and there he grumbles, God knows what, but I'll be sworn he knows not so much as one character of the tongue. Why then it's Greek to him. <laughs> uh, Milo, not write and read. Not a letter and you would hang him. Then he'll never be saved by his book. Oh. No, nor by his good works, for he'll, he'll do none. Signors both, I commend you to the skies. I commit you to God. I do. Nay, sweet Reese, a little more. A little more will make me a great deal less. Housekeeping, you know, is out of fashion. Unless I write post, I kiss the post. In a word, I'll tell you all. Challenge was sent, answer no fight, no kill, all friends, all fools. Emula rewards her own brave man. Very well. Dinner, I'm hungry, little cheer, great, great stomach, meat, 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 mouth, 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 mouth. <laughs> adieu, adieu, adieu. Exit Reese with possibly one of the best plot summaries for a scene we've never <laughs> seen ever. Um... <laughs> <laughs> Aha, a Jew, Reese Owen, belike, keeps a lean kitchen. What else, man? That's one of the miserable vows he makes when he's dubbed. Yet he doth but as many of his brother knights do, keep an ordinary table for him and his long coat follower. Ah, that long coat makes the master a little king, for whatsoever his uh, piece of a follower comes hopping after him, he's sure of a double guard. I'll set some of the pages upon thy skirts for this. I shall feel them no more than so many fleas, therefore I care not. But, Farnese, you'll prove a most accomplished coxcomb. Ah, old touch, lad. This yonker is right Trinidado, pure leaf tobacco. For indeed, he's nothing. Puff, reek, and would be tried not by God in his country, but by fire. The very soul of his substance and needs would convert into smoke. He's steel to the back, you see, for he writes challenges. Uh, true, and iron to the head. Oh, there's a rich lead and mineral amongst his brains, if his skull were well digged. Uh, Sir Urchenzi, this is one of those changeable silk gallants who, in a very scurvy pride, scorn all scholars and read no books but a looking glass, and speak no language but sweet lady and sweet signor and chew between their teeth terrible words as though they would conjure as compliment and projects and fastidious and capricious and misprision and the synthesis of the soul and such like raise velvet terms what be the accoutrements of these gallants indeed that's one of their fustian outlandish phrases too mary sir their accoutrements are all the fantastic fashions that can be taken up, either upon trust or at second hand. What their qualities? Uh, none good. Uh, these are the best, uh, to make good faces, to take tobacco well, to spit well, to laugh like a waiting gentlewoman, to lie well, to blush for nothing, to look big upon little fellows, to scoff with a grace, though they have a very filthy grace in scoffing, and for a need to ride pretty and well. They cannot choose but ride well, because every wit, uh, because every good wit rides well. Now here's the difference, that they ride upon horses, and when they are ridden, they are spurred for asses. So they can cry, wee and holla, kicking jade. <laughs> they care not if they have no more learning than a jade. No more of these jadish tricks. Here comes the hobby horse. Oh, he would dance a Morris rarely if he were hung with bells. He would jangle villainously. Peace, let's encounter them. Enter Emulo and Sir Owen talking, Reese after them, eat, eating secretly. Because Sir Emulo, Sir Owen is glad out of cry because he is friends with her, for Sir Owen swear. Did her not swear, Rice, Reese? Yes, forsooth. Spits out his meat. By God, is swear terrible to gnog her pid and fling her spinger legs at plum trees when her come to fall to her tiger and fencing trigs? Yes, faith, and to break her shins, did her not, Reese? Uh, yeah, yes, by my truth, sir. By God's odge me, is all true, and to give her a great deal of bloody nose, because, Sir Emulo, you challenge the British knight. Reese, you know, Sir Owen, gentlemen, first, and secondly, 
Knicked. What a pox ale you race. Is shock now? Uh, no, sir, I have my five senses as well as any man. Well, here is hand. Now is mighty friends. The Owen. Oh, now the gallimaufry of language comes in. I protest to you. The magnitude of my condolment hath been <laughs> elevated the higher to see you and myself, two gentlemen. Nay, hey, tis well known Sir Owen is a good gentleman, is not Reese? He that denies, sir, I'll make him his words. Good friend, I am not in the negative, but not so capricious, you misprize me. My collocution tendeth to Sir Owen dignifying. Let's step in. Uh, God save you, Signor Emulo. Well encountered, Sir Owen. Oh, how do you? Sir Emulo is friends out of cry now. But Emulos, take heed you match no more love tricks to when widow Gwentheans. By God, urge me that do that do so much, Knogber. See you now. Not so tempestuous, sweet knight. Though to my disconsolation, I will oblivionize my love to the Welsh widow and to here proclaim my delinquishment. But, sweet signor, be not too diagenical to me. Huh? Huh? Is no, is no not what genicals mean. <laughs> but Sir Owen will genical her and her cage, her genicaling Gwynethane. Uh, nay, Faith, we'll have you sound friends indeed. Otherwise, you know, Signor Emulo, if you should bear all the wrongs, you would be out at list. Most true. By God, is out a cry, friends. But hark, Fernese, Urchense, twag a great deal to Emulo's Owen is great deal of friends. Ha, ha, uh, is tell fine admirable chest uh, by, by God, Emulos, for fear Owen, knock her sins, is tell Owen by dozen gentlemen, her puts is about with lads. Ha, ha, sertor, sertor. Uh, no more. Now tell Orchense of it. Why should you two fall out for the love of a woman, considering what store we have of them? Uh, Sir Emulo, I gratulate your peace. Uh, your company, you know, is precious to us, and we'll be merry and ride abroad. Uh, before God, now I talk of riding, Sir Owen, methinks, has an excellent boot. His leg graces the boot. By God, is fine leg, and fine boot too, but Emulo's leg is better and finer, and shanglier skin to wear. I bought them of a penurious codwainer, and they are the most incongruent that e'er I wear. Congruent? Splud. <clears throat> I what leather is congruent? Spanish leather? Ha! Ha! Well, gentlemen, I have other projects beckon for me. I must digress from this bias and leave you. Accept, I beseech you, of this vulgar and domestic compliment. Whilst they are saluting, Sir Owen gets to Emulo's leg and pulls down his boot. Pray, Emulo, let her see her congruent leather. Ha ha ha! What a pox is here! Ha ha! Is Major Wall to her shins for keep her warm? Oh, what's here? Lace? Uh, where is the lime and hair, Emulo? Oh, there it is. This to save his shins. Ha ha! Rhys, go call Gwenthian. I, I I will master the homo Gwenthian, the homo. A pogs on her. I go fetch her and call her within. I, I'm gone, sir. Exit Reese. Nay, Sir Owen, what mean you? By God, is meant to let Gwenthian see what booby fool love her. A pogs on you, Sir Owen and Signors both. Do not expatriate my obliqu obliquy. Obloquy, my love shall be so fast conglutinated to you. God's blood, you call her glutens? <laughs> Gwenthian, so Gwenthian. Mm, not this, just this pill. Signors, adieu. 
You are fastidious, and I banish you. And exit Emulo. Oh, God, so here comes the widow. But in faith, Sir Owen, say nothing of this. No, go to then. Why can't Sir Owen bear as brave a mind as an emperor? Before we get to the entrance of uh, <laughs> Gwynethian, um, or Gwynethian, um, yes, there's a lot to unpack here. I mean, it's like we've stumbled into a different play completely. It's like we've entered a humorous play, um, and it's all this uh, stuff. Oh, oh, look at this person who comes on. His humour is to use too many long words, and his humour is there. Uh, these people fight a lot, and this person pretends he can read and really and wanders around reading sonnets, and ha, ha, ha. There's some lovely... There are some lovely little turns of phrase there's some lovely lines um there's a really nice um <laughs> there's some really nice slightly rude gags in there <laughs> is no not what uh, genitals me genitals mean <laughs> uh, i think it's one of the the, the 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 cats i think isn't it it's a genitals cat um uh, <laughs> well, <jellical. laughs> yeah <laughs> uh so i mean there's a and uh, i think i'm you know doing this scene properly um with with work so you know what's going on um it's nice because it's sort of you enter mid mid flow you enter with some backstory that you know was there a fight no there wasn't a fight they didn't have a fight in the end but they're fighting over things and i just love reese's just doing uh, was it Reese who did? Yeah, who did the plot summary? Uh, and just basically explain <laughs> this, 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 this stuff, 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 and bye. Um, <laughs> and yeah, I was just going lovely, lovely. I, I really, I really enjoyed a lot of that. I also didn't understand a reasonable percentage of that, but I, I, but some of that was deliberate, and some of that wasn't. It was, um, yeah. Um, love shall be so fast conglutinated to you. Um, <laughs> so, <laughs> lovely things, Lynn. I, oh, I didn't understand about 90% of what I was saying, so... Mm. Yeah, uh, I think it, we really need to unpack um, certainly uh, the Sir Owen stuff. Uh, it's not so straight uh, difficult, actually. It's just you have these so many hers in there, um, which is sort yeah. of a standard. We we have this with Club Law um, of the her uh, as, as sort of a, just a... A standard marking thing for Welsh. Um, it's uh, it, it 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 does right. seem to be, turn up in other texts as well. Yeah, and the other the other sort of s stereotypical Welsh mispronunciation is they use unvoiced consonants where in English it would be voiced like poot for boot. Mm. Uh, but sometimes in in this for this character they do it the other way around, so it's really uh, but harg instead of hark. G and K are the same sound, one's voiced and one's unvoiced. Um, so yeah, you would really have to go through and translate for yourself. What's he actually saying? Mm. It, on the fly, I, I I didn't have time to to figure out a lot of it. But for a, for a cold read, it it flowed it flowed very nicely. I felt even if I wasn't <laughs> always with 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 it, I was sort of with it. I was sort of going, I'm enjoying this ride. This ride is interesting. This ride flows. Um... Uh, we I poured Miss Scene, of course, because the uh, uh, the uh, uh, Gwynethian has uh, is is about to enter. Any additional thoughts before we uh, we we complete the scene, Eric? I, I do like how Reese was basically like, "I'm starving. Leave me alone. <laughs> I have shit to do. Go get. I'm gonna go get food now." <laughs> yeah, I, I, I yeah, I, I, you know, I, I like the fact that you're know, Reese after them eating secretly, and it's like they turn to ask him a question. And it's, <laughs> <laughs> It's nice, it's nice bits of business. I, you know, it's giving the actors something to do. Um. Uh, and yeah, uh, I'm. I, that said, there's, there's still a possibility that this plot line will not go where we're hoping it will go. So uh, just uh, don't get too comfortable. Um. So enter Gwenithian. Who calls Gwenithian so great deal of time? Sweet widow, even your countrymen here. Really. Belie the rudder way, ride you with all Monday. Any mood, I will in my arm. So, Rowan, Gramercy, we went to you and Malage any. I will have a sign and run more. Mandage, what fall well? Oh, my good widow, gamble that we understand you and have at you. Have at her. Nay, my God, is no have at her too, is tog in her prettish tongue, for tis fine delicate's tongue, 
I can tell her, Welsh tongue is finer as Greek tongue. Mm, a baked neat's tongue is finer than both. But what says Gwynthia now? We'll have Sir Owen? So Owen is known for a wisely man as any since Adam and Eve's time, and that is, by God's urge me, a great deal ago. I think Solomon was wiser than Sir Owen. <laughs> Solomon had pretty wit, but what say you to the king's tabby? King Tavi is well known, was as good a musician as the best fiddler in all Italy, and King Tavi was Sir Owen's countryman. Yes, truly, a pretty gentleman born, and the twinkle, 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 out a cry upon Welsh harp. And tis known Tavi love mistress Persebe, as Sir Owen loveth Gwyneth. Will her have Sir Owen now? Faith, widow, take him. Sir Owen is a tall man, I can tell you. Tall man, as God urge me, her think the pretty gentleman is valiant as Mars, that is, the fine knaves, the poets say. The god of pribbles and prebbles. I hope, widow, you see little more in Sir Owen than in Sir Emulous. Say, shall her have her hair now? Tis valiant as can desire, I warrant her. Sir Owen, tis not for valiant Gwenthian care so much, but for honest and virtuous and loving and pundled to let her have a will. God urge me, take her away to her husband, and is let her have her will out a cry. Yet, by God, is pridle, is pridle her well enough. Sir Owen, Gwentian is going to her cousin Walter, the Duke, who you know is a near cousin by marriage, my other husband that bring her from Wales. <laughs> By God, Wales is better country than Italy, a great deal so better. Now if a country cousin Walter say, Gwenthian, tactless British knight, I shall love the earth, Digon, but must have a good will. Mock you that, Sir Owen. Ow, oh, what else? Sir Owen, mark that very well. You shall take her down quickly, in, quickly enough. Come, widow. We'll wag to the coward, now to her cousin, and bid her cousin tell her mind to of Sir Owen. Your man went in, Sir Owen? Yes, by God, and bravely too. Come, gentlemen, you'll take pains to go with her. I uh, will follow you presently, Sir Owen. Come, widow. Un lodis glan gwynthian an mondu. Mercy, we I'm a mock honour. Exuant Sir Owen and Gwynthian. Oh, this will be rare. Uh, Sir Uchenzi, at the marriage night of these two, instead of I O Hymen, we shall hear uh, Hey Ho Hymen. Their love will be like a great fire made of bay leaves that yields nothing but cracking noise, noise. If she misses crown, tis no matter for cracking. Uh, so she solder it again, it will pass current. Enter Onifrio and Julia walking over the stage. Oh, peace! Here comes our fair mistress. Let's have a fling at her. You, so you may, but the hardness is to hit her. Farewell. Farnese, you attend well upon your mistress? Nay, nay, their wages shall be of the same colour that their service is of. A faith, mistress, would you had travelled a little sooner this way? You should have seen a rare comedy acted by Emulo. Every courteous mouth will be a stage for that. Rather tell her of the Welsh tragedy that's towards. What tragedy? A Sir Owen shall marry your cousin Gwenthian. It's possible. Aye, they too will beget brave <laughs> warriors. For if she scold, he'll fight. And if he quarrel, she'll take up the bucklers. She's fire, and he's brimstone. That's not be their hot doings, then, think you? They'll prove turtles, for their heart strings being so like they cannot choose but be loving. Turtles? Turkey cocks. The God's love lets intrigue the Duke, my brother, to make a law that wheresoever Sir Owen and his lady dwell, the next neighbour may always be constable. Lest the peace be broken. 
and they'll do nothing but cry, harm, harm. I think Sir Owen would rather die than lose her love. So think not I. I should for Julia, if I were Julia's husband. Therefore Julia shall not be on a Freo's wife, for I'll have none die for me. I like not that colour. Yes, for your love you would, Julia. No, nor yet for my hate for Enzi. Would you not have men love you, sweet mistress? No, not I. Fire upon it, sweet servant. Would you wish men to hate you? Yes, rather than love me. Of all your saints, I love not to serve Mistress Venus. Then I perceive you mean to lead apes in hell. That spiteful proverb was proclaimed against them that are married upon earth. But to be married is to live in a kind of hell. Aye, as they do at Barley Break. Your wife is your ape, and that heavy burthen, wedlock. Your jack and apes clog. Therefore, I'll not be tied to it. Master Fanesi, sweet virginity is that invisible godhead that turns us into angels, that makes us saints on earth and stars in heaven. Here, virgins seem godly, but they're glorious. In heaven is no wooing, yet all there are lovely. In heaven are no weddings, yet all there are lovers. Let us, sweet madam, turn earth into heaven by being all lovers here, too. So we do. To an earthly heaven we turn it. Nay, but dear Julia, tell us why so much you hate to enter into the lists of this same combat matrimony. You may well call that a combat. For indeed, marriage is nothing else but a battle of love, a friendly fighting, a kind of favourable, terrible war. You err, Onofrio, in thinking I hate it. I deal by marriage as some Indians do by the sun. Adore it and reverence it, but dare not stare on it, for fear I be stark blind. You three are bachelors, for being sick of this maidenhead, count all things bitter, which the physic of a single life ministers unto you. You imagine, if you could make the arms of fair ladies the spheres of your hearts, Good hearts, then you were in heaven. Oh, but bachelors, take heed. You are no sooner in that heaven, but you slip straight into hell. As long as I have a beautiful lady to torment me, I care not. Nor I. The sweetness of her looks shall make me relish any punishment. Except the punishment of the horn, Urchense. Put that in. Nay, we will best put that by. See what unthrifts this love makes us. He wants but get into our mouths. He labours to turn our tongues to clappers and to ring all in at Cupid's church when we were better to bite off our tongues so we may thrust him out. Cupid is sworn enemy to time, and he that loseth time, I can tell you, loseth a friend. Aye, a bald friend. Therefore, my good servants, if you wear my livery, Cast off this loose upper coat of love. Be ashamed to wait upon a boy, a wag, a blind boy, a wanton. My brother, the Duke, wants our companies. Tis idleness and love make you captives to this solitariness. Follow me and love not, and I'll teach you how to find liberty. We obey, obey to follow you, but not to, not love, to love you. you. We love renounce you. that exactly. obedience. And they exit. Yeah, it's a weird subplot, this, in many ways. I mean, the fact that we have this sort of barnstorming sequence from Julia um, about love, it's suddenly... Does anyone else feel like we've just stumbled into a Marston play? It just feels like this is one of those sort of aside scenes where, you know, a, a peripheral character will dis discourse in a slightly... Um, uh, sort of... Uh, cynical way about love and the universe um the, the, i mean it's really interesting stuff um i'm just not whereas the first two scenes for all the various you know the act one's problems uh in terms of what the play is about um felt like you had a very clear thread as to what the plot was and where where this was going here we have got a plot but it, it's it's crowded with so much other business and other stuff you sort of forget that it's actually a 
relatively straightforward what's going on here um and and uh yeah and th again we do have the the, the gags like uh, instead of io hymen they shall hear hey ho hymen which you know <laughs> <laughs> oh, <God. laughs> uh, oh yeah um anyway lots of cracking uh elin yeah it, you know i didn't actually so much get the sense that we're in a different play i mean although i can certainly see i understand that reaction uh julia's attitude towards love and marriage seems more like a sort of thoughtful a deliberate counterpoint this this play is meditating on on that institution and uh and it's and its usefulness and it's and it's and it's you know value um because we seem to take for granted that it's what it's what people do it's they fall in love and get married and julia is saying you know it's it's a miserable state of being it's a miserable way of being in the in in the world and i think and that feels more like a a deliberate purposeful counterpoint and you know, and that the, we, we've got this discussion of this this marriage here that, that is being, you know, of uh, you've got two people who are going to their temperaments are not suited to one another, or at least that's what all everybody thinks, uh, and you know where that's going to go, and and, and uh, everyone has an opinion. Um, everyone has opinions about everybody else's business. That that seems to be something that's going on here as well. Um, other thoughts, Alan? Did I see you waving? Yeah, I I must admit I was trying to work out the connections between within that scene even mm. because it apart from the the common characters of Benazi etc it, it just seemed to do a sort of screeching amberic turn halfway through and again I had a similar issue to what Lynn was commenting on earlier trying to work out what the hell Gwenthian was actually trying to say um because of the the way it is written as cod welsh and occasionally in theory actual welsh though i think well, it's right, even more yeah, cod welsh yeah. well right yeah. yes you know no, not a sheep inside well in a sense what we've got is you know people talking about the planned matches and then you start meeting you meet the what the, what the proposed match halfway through uh, uh but you're right there, there is a sort of general change of energy it's really interesting the using of uh, for an uh forense and uh my character uh, Chenze, uh, almost as these m sort of linking mouthpieces. It starts. It feels very Jacobean. Looking ahead, mm. actually, of this little double act who are there, going, "Oh, what's going on over here? Oh, this is happening. Oh, lovely. Let's stand back and watch for a bit." Mm. Um, which feel gives it s a sense of unity, even if um, it moves in lots of different directions. Uh, Lois. Yeah, I think Frenesi even calls it a play that uh, uh, that they're watching. You know. Uh, uh, with the, the absurd performance of Emulo. Um, yeah, I mean, I think it's all working out kind of thematically, isn't it? I mean, we've everybody presumably knew the story of Griselda anyway, so they presumably knew that it was a story about a very patient woman and a very, uh, to put it mildly, difficult marriage. And now we've clearly got a very fiery tempered woman who wants to be boss, who's about to get married to, to somebody else who's also pretty peppery. And then we've got people courting uh, this woman who is the sister of somebody I, I guess it's since it's the duke i guess this isn't the marquis it's the other guy his is, is his brother the duke i mean they all seem to be related there, right? there are two, like, at least two dukes in the play yes so yeah. uh, um it could be pavia yes uh, i'm not yeah. sure i i will check that yeah. or someone will check yeah uh, so that's yeah. how they're all vaguely connected yeah mm. uh no i think julia is 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 is, is the marquis's um sister oh she I is because I, I thought she said uh uh, my brother, the Duke, uh, mm. wants our companies. But then, I mean, that sounds more like the Marquis because he's the one that keeps telling people to, to uh, wait on him. But, but he's not a Duke. Well, maybe they're just using the term slightly interchangeably. Yeah, um, yeah that was my impression. Duke, Marquis, leader, head of state. I, I, guy. I, mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Alan, then we'll move on. Yeah, I mean, there's also the somewhat casual use we found in a lot of early modern with brother and sister. Mm -hmm. cousin uncle mm -hmm. in all of the relationships are short-handed mm -hmm. but that the set the second half of that sequence the, the one with julia almost felt to me more like restoration comedy than 
the sort of stuff we've been dealing with from better part of a century earlier. Mm. Well, I mean, it's it's all it feels very much peace with the sort of the the humor stuff that we've been doing recently, mm. and you know, and, uh, that which is sort of looking ahead. Well, will you know, uh, restoration will look back to to a degree. So uh, I think it, you, you're you're absolutely right in terms of that's that's there's a thread there uh, mm. that uh, this might be a, a part of the a much larger tapestry. Mm. Uh, Elizabeth, then we will definitely move on. Yeah, I had a bit of a sense of Bert and Ernie to Anese and Fenese. Um <laughs> I, I like the way the characters bounced off each other. I, it was like, it's like an interlude. This sequence has been like an interlude, but the characters bounce off each other so well. And I really like Julia. I think she has a lot of agency. I, I think she represents this maybe transactional nature of this love match or this, the, the, the question about Grizel's poorness and the Marcus's wealth is interesting because all these relationships are transactional you know love really has very little to do with it mm. Mm. yeah oh yes I, I don't get the impression that you know the 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 uh, uh fr from the a plot that the love you know there, there was it was all status and wealth and things and yeah uh it does suggest that the authors are bearing in mind the problems of the original story and going well what can we counterpoint it with yeah uh, whether it's enough we shall see as we go into the final scene of the session act two scene two enter the marquis and furio furio my lord uh, thy faith i oft have tried thy faith i credit for i have found it solid as the rock no babbling echo sits upon thy lips for silence even in speech doth seal them up Wilt thou be trusty, Furio, to thy lord? I will. Uh, it is enough. Those words, I will, yield sweeter music than the gilded sounds which chatting parrots, long-tongued sycophants, send from the organs of their siren voice. Grissel, my wife, thou seest, bear in her womb the joy of marriage. Furio, I protest my love to her, is as the heat to fire, her love to me as beauty to the sun, inseparable adjuncts. In one word, so dearly love I Grissel that my life shall end when she doth end to be my wife. Is well done. Yet is my bosom burnt up with desires to try my Grissel's patience. I'll put on a wrinkled forehead and turn both mine eyes into two balls of fire and clasp my hand like to a mace of iron to threaten death. But Furio, when this hand lifts up to strike, it shall fly open to embrace my love. Yet Grissel must not know this. All not my words, uh, all my words shall smack of wormwood, all my deeds of gall. My tongue shall jar, my heart be musical. Yet Grissel must not know this. Not for me. Furio, my trial is thy secrecy. Enter Grissel. Yonder she comes. On goes this mask of frowns. Tell her I am angry. Men, men, try your wives. Love that abides sharp tempests sweetly thrives my lord is angry angry the heavens forfend with whom for what is it with me not me may i presume to touch the vein of that sad discontent which swells upon my dear lord's angry brow away away Oh, chide me not away, your handmaid Grissel, with unvexed thoughts and with unrepining soul will bear the burden of all sorrows, of all woe, before the smallest grief should wound you so. I am not beholding to your love for this. Woman, I love thee not. Thine eyes to mine are eyes of basilisks. They murder me. Suffer me to part hence, I'll tear them out, because they work such treason to my love. Talk not of love, 
I hate thee more than poison that sticks upon the air's infected wings, exhaled up by the hot breath of the sun. Tis for thy sake that speckled infamy sits like a screech owl on my honored breast to make my subjects stare and mock at me. <laughs> they swear they'll never bend their awful knees to the base issue of thy beggar womb. Tis for thy sake they curse me, rail at me, Thinkst thou then I can love thee? Oh, my soul, why didst thou build this mountain of my shame? Why lie my joys buried in Grissel's name? My gracious lord. Call not me gracious lord. See, woman, here hangs up thine ancestry, the monuments of thy nobility. This is thy russet gentry, coat and crest. Thy earthen honors I will never hide, because this bridal shall pull in thy pride. Poor Grisel is not proud of these attires. They are to me but as your livery, and from your humble servant, when you please, you may take all this outside, which indeed is none of Grisel's. Her best wealth is need. I'll cast this gayness off, and be content to wear this russet bravery of my own for that's more warm than this i shall look old no sooner in coarse frieze than cloth of gold spite of my soul she'll triumph over me and the marquis drops his glove uh, your glove my lord um, cast down my glove again stoop you for it for i will have you stoop and kneel even to the meanest groom i keep tis but my duty if you'll have me stoop even to your meanest groom, my lord, I'll stoop. Furia, how slovenly thou goest attired. Uh, why so, my lord? Uh, look here, thy shoes are both untied. Grissel, kneel you and tie them. Pardon me. Quickly, I charge you. Friend, you do me wrong to let me hold my lord in wrath so long. Stand still, I'll kneel and tie them. What I do, Furio, tis done to him and not to you. She ties them. Strange. Tis so. Oh, strange, oh, admirable patience. I fear when Gristle's bones sleep in her grave, the world a second Gristle ne'er will have. <clears throat> now, get you in. I go, my gracious lord. Exit Grizzle. Didst thou not hear her sigh? Did not one frown contract her beauteous forehead? I saw none. Did not one drop fall down from sorrow's eyes to blame my heart for these her injuries? Faith, not a drop. I fear she'll frown on me for doing me service. Furial, that I'll try. My voice may yet o'ertake her. Gristle! Gristle! Re-enter Gristle. She comes at first call. Did my lord call? Ah, woman, I called thee not. I said, this slave was like to gristle, gristle. And must thou therefore come to torture me? Uh, nay, stay, uh, here's a companion fit for you. <laughs> thou vexest me, so doth this villain too. But ere the sun to his highest throne ascend, my indignation in his death shall end. Oh, pardon him, my lord, for mercy's wings bear round about the world the fame of kings. Temper your wrath, I beg it on my knee. Forgive his fault, though you'll not pardon me. Thank her. Uh, thank you, madam. Ah, I have not true power to wound thee with denial. Ah, oh, my gristle, how dearly should I love thee, yet die to do thee good, but that my subjects upbraid me with thy birth and call it base, and grieve to see thy father and thy brother heaved up to dignities. Oh, cast them down, and send poor Grissel poorly home again. High cedars fall, when low shrubs safe remain. Uh, fetch me a cup of wine. Exit Grissel. Enter at the same door, Mario and Lepido. He's a saint, sure. Ah, Furia, now I'll boast that I have found an angel upon earth. She shall be crowned the empress of all women. Lepido, Mario, what was she that passed by you? Your, Your virtuous, virtuous wife. 
Call her not virtuous, for I abhor her. Did not her swollen eyes look red with hate or scorn? Did she not curse my name or, or Furio's name? No, my dear lord. For he and I railed at her, spit at her. I'll burst her heart with sorrow, for I grieve to see you grieve that I've wronged my state by loving one whose baseness now I hate. Re-enter Gristle with wine. Come faster if you can. Uh, forbear, Mario, I, tis but her office. What she does to me, she shall perform to any of you three. I'm glad to see her pride thus trampled on. Now serve Mario, then serve Lepido. And as you bow to me, so bow to them. I'll not deny it to win a diadem. Your wisdom I commend that have the power to raise or throw down as you smile or lower. Your patience I commend that can abide to hear a flatterer speak, yet never chide. Hence, hence, dare you control them whom I grace? Come not within my sight. I will obey, and if you please, ne'er more behold the day. Exit Grissel. Furia. My lord. Watch her where she goes, and mark how in her looks this trial shows. I will. Exit Furio. Mario. Lepido, I loathe this gristle, as sick men loathe the bitterest potion which the physician's hand holds out to them. For God's sake, frown upon her when she smiles. For God's sake, smile for joy to see her frown. For God's sake, scorn her, call her beggar's brat, torment her with your looks, your words, your deeds. My heart shall leap for joy that her heart bleeds. Wilt thou do this, Mario? If you say, Mario, do this, I must in it obey. I know you must. So, Lepido, must you. It is well, uh, but counsel me what's best to do. How shall I please my subjects? Do but speak, I'll do it, though Bristle's heart in sunder break. Your subjects do repine at nothing more than to behold Janiculo, a father and her base brother lifted up so high. To banish them from court were policy. Oh, rare, oh, profound wisdom. Uh, dear Mario, it forthwith shall be done. They shall not stay, though I may win by them a kingdom's sway. Exit Marquis. Mario, laugh at this. Why, so I do. Headlong I had rather fall to misery than see a beggar raised to dignity. They exit the charming, charming people that they are. End of act two. So, uh, the Marquis gives an incredibly detailed <laughs> exposition as to why he's going to try Grizzle's patience. No, sorry, missed that. Uh, he just says he kind of feels like it. Um, <laughs> he's burnt up with desires to try my gristles. That's it. There, There is no reason given at all yeah. Yeah. Um, why he's going to just do this stuff. And he does this stuff. And yeah. Yeah. And then, yeah. Yeah, some, some things. Uh, Lynn. Uh, you're muted at the moment, Lynn. I... I, I, I could hardly hate him more. Um, but I I do think there's a hint that part of what he's doing, part of this thing he's stage managing, is to bring his courtiers and his people around by showing them how incredibly saintly she is. So um, I, I think that's part of what's, what's going on, is he loves her, he wants his people and his courtiers to accept her, so he's... Tr he's He's setting up this this show, um, um, this test that she's going to pass again and again with flying colors, so that um, his his brother and his courtiers and his people have to say, yeah, she's poor, but she's an incredibly good person, uh, and and we embrace her now. Maybe I'm actually giving him too much credit because. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, because uh, his courtiers are not 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 great people, are they? Just um, that yeah, that closing life. Let's laugh at the horrible things he's doing to his wife there. <laughs> just gonna, maybe you should just <laughs> cast out all those 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 people who've uh, who's who's uh, 
had their statuses raised. Yeah, good plan. Lois? I think he's also using this to test his courtiers. I mean, presumably those two guys are going to get thrown out on their ear when this is over. Yeah, I mean, that's that's the thing. Yes. Uh, yeah, get, just get a better court, Marquis, and then, you know, banish yourself mm. while you're there, uh, while you're at it. L uh, Elizabeth? Yeah, that line, men, men, try your wives. Love that abides sharp tempest sweetly thrives. I was like, <laughs> what? Mm. <laughs> Love that abides what what does yeah, that mean like, yeah that, uh yeah yeah, 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 die in agony, Marquis. <laughs> I mean, that's quite early. It's quite early. The calling for the death of the Marquis. Uh, I say that doesn't usually happen until the the final act when uh, when people's patient the audience. It's the audience's patience that we need to work with here because this is uh, you know the the audience response to the previous iteration of uh, of this story uh, was was just yeah we're not we're not buying this and yeah we've already said in the chat here that what we need is the audience to call out for Babulo whenever they feel that the Marquis needs a punch in the face. And uh, I feel that he's 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 not going to be walking by the end of this scene um, because, yeah, it's never ending. And also the courtiers are going to start being taken down as well. I, I'm not obviously one here to pro as a proponent for onstage physical violence and such a gratuitous sense, but I don't know. I'm starting to feel it's justified. Uh, Alan. I'm, ju I'm just getting a strong feeling that they're almost riffing off Taming of a Shrew. Mm. Um, you know, it, for slightly different purposes, but uh, the, there seemed to be some commonality of plot line between the two. Yeah. Mm. But the well, I mean, in, in a sense, Gristle is, a, is an older story in that sense. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, it, it's got its own antecedents as well. And this doesn't have a framing narrative uh, which mm. which tempers some of the problems with uh, a shrew um which uh yeah. th 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 that that yeah. gives us uh, some some room for maneuver but yes i mean they're, they're, i think it's dancing on those similar similar themes but actually the, the b plot is much more shrewish uh in that sense of um mm. you know the, the the two uh who are matched who are too fiery in their temperaments uh we are approaching extra time as it were uh we've read two acts um I'm sure funs, fun times have been had by all. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Keep uh, taking the tablets. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, it's a bit early days because, you know, for all we know, where the plot takes this might might, might take as well. I, 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 I don't feel that, as, again, the material ever gives Gristle anything to work with because uh, it's all pe Gristle is patient. Mm. Gristle has no internal mm. life. Gristle has no doesn't seem to have much in the way of an internal monologue um, uh, that may be shared with the audience. Not that many people do in this play. Um, Lois. Um, yeah, um, Gristle does have one uh, speech, actually. Your patience I commend that can abide to hear a flatterer speak, yet never chide. You know, and she's talking about what uh, his courtiers, I mean, Mario has just said, your wisdom I commend that have the power to raise or throw down as you smile or allow her. So she is actually uh, coming out with an opinion about uh, that guy's behavior. Hmm. That is it enough? Is it well, enough? Um... How can it be? I mean, you know, she's stuck in this story, but, uh, but still. Mm. Uh, so uh, final thoughts. Elizabeth, do you have any final thoughts about the play so far? I'm really enjoying it. Like, I know you said that there, are, that, that there was another patient in Grizel and it we didn't go down well. We weren't down like a lead balloon. Mm. But this one, I think, is the Marcus is just those characters, one of those characters you just love to hate. Mm. And Babulo, I thought, really jumped off the page. And even Grizel, I, I want the best for her. I really want her to come through this well and, um, and, to be victorious although i think it's unlikely because she's so patient and so good um but i'm enjoying the play immensely mm -hmm. uh uh lynn uh any final thoughts yeah elizabeth's just a better person than i am <laughs> <laughs> not a high bar oh, but sorry I mean, about that yeah, <laughs> I, but, but, yeah. Um, the fact that she can find something to enjoy, I, it's just making me really uncomfortable. I, yeah, the, the, the Marquis is, yeah, he's really toxic. <laughs> uh, you know, 
I, I just, I can't turn myself into a red, a, you know, an early modern person and, uh, and engage with this play in, in that way. I have to engage with it as myself and, uh, and I'm finding it kind of hateful. Mm. Mm. But it, I mean, are the playwrights, whether they're successful or not, are they attempting to make it, are we supposed to feel sympathy with the Marquis at all? Are, is, you know, yeah, is he supposed to be a character we're supposed to be liking? Or is, is there a moral theme going on here that we're not necessarily supposed to actually like the Marquis, but he's doing these things because of story? Um, you know, it's like the, the playwrights couldn't come up with a reason. They clearly just, I, I, and I get the impression there was a, there was a meeting. Right, what, why is the Marquis doing any of this? D don't go there. We, there's because story that's the reason he's doing this because you know they might have put that in i, I it's like you know, what do you what where do you take that um uh lois yeah well this is chaucer's clark's tale and mm -hmm. uh, at the end of it the clark uh tells his readers that um uh, uh you know it's like it's the story of job essentially and that uh, uh just as god tested job's patience you know uh the Marquis is testing Griselda's, and then he also does say, "Don't try this on your wives." And he <laughs> and he says, that, that, "You know that that God uh, God has a purpose in what he's doing." And I think he sort of suggests that you know the Marquis is a human being, and uh, that the, the story may be a bit dodgy, but that it's a kind of analog to the way God does sometimes try people's patience. And presumably, I mean, Chaucer was widely read, and I'm sure the story. Uh, mm. was known from Chaucer as well as from other tellings. So I think the audience is sort of prepared to see a, a kind of jokier version in a way of it, uh, because I think it is on the whole done more lightly than in Chaucer. I mean, even in Chaucer, there is a bit near the end where I think uh, Griselda does say something that is uh, very mild, but could certainly be taken as pretty critical of the way that this man has been treating her. Mm. Yeah, I mean, it's 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 just such a shame that we don't have those, uh, you know, lighter comic versions of the story of Job um, that, that we could entrance this with, um, you know, uh, to, to, to to see if that that that, that reading uh, works. <laughs> uh, Alan, any final thoughts? Yeah, I think too early really to come up with anything final. I mean, the Cod Welsh just felt to me like it was there to please the groundlings, you know, oh, let's take the piss out of some other silly accent. Um, and it almost felt like this was an established routine that, yeah, fine, we put in that sketch number 3B, you know, as a cut and paste job almost. No, it's interesting about the whole the whole Welsh sequence because one of the, you know, two of them, the characters are Welsh. One one is extensively Welsh and the other one is is isn't. <laughs> Uh, in terms of accent work, etc. Et so it's, it is interesting to have these, there are variations there going on. Uh, and I think that's a scene that actually unpacked and, and rehearsed and worked, actually probably, is it, I mean, the subplot's quite interesting. I wonder whether the subplot, uh, I, I, depending on where it goes, um, actually has more legs than the A plot, because um, mm. there's something interesting going on there. And uh, and it's, it's this thing, of course, I really like Babulo. I think Babulo is a really nicely drawn clown. Mm. It's not a clown that annoys me. Um, it's, you know, the, most of the gags are landing, and he's sort of open-hearted, and he wants to punch and has punched the Marquis. So uh, it feels like there's part of me going, I want to drag this play through because I, I want to keep Babulo, because there's some nice stuff there. There really is. Uh, Eric, any final thoughts? I haven't been there for the other patient Grizel. I seem to remember like the, these long the, the the father Grizel scene was much more extensive, um, and that uh, she kind of I mean she did this whole thing, you know, poor uh, discussing sort of the virtues of poverty and then having to marry because her her father was sick if I remember correctly, mm. um, which kind of justified the leap into sort of, you know, a bad marriage, I guess. Um, whereas this one is kind of like, I don't know, there's that line of sort of, um, you know, I'll, in this one, um, which um, she, she, she kind of goes, I'll not deny it to, to win a diadem. And obviously, in, in this case, she might be speaking metaphorically, because obviously, you know, sort of... Um, uh, it kind of she she's never craved anything. She's she's patient with Grisel, like anything like riches and so on. But it also comes across as sort of like, yeah, sure, I'll do anything for money. 
um which is kind of weird it just yeah i i i'm curious to see where this is going to go because the other version is kind of yeah dodgy <laughs> As as as, I mean, yeah. I I don't know if there's any way to make the marker still good, um, unless you sort of have him sign a prenup or something. Uh, <laughs> it, it's it's that it's that kind of concept. I think that, that that's the whole that's the whole thing of like I have to test her to see if she's after my wealth or kind of thing. Mm. But I mean, in this case, it doesn't really come across unless he's lying. Yes, it's the thing. It's not even he's testing her to you know see if he's she's just uh, uh, after his wealth. It's just I I just feel like testing her. It 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 it, it doesn't there a reason is does not appear to be properly given, mm -hmm. uh, and that makes it just yeah all all the harder to take. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, and the relationship with the father uh, Janiculo is is interesting here, and and you know because he is so obsequious the moment the Marquis enters. I mean, it really is. Oh, I'm ever so humble, Mister Copperfield. You know. Um, yeah, it's very unctuous. Uh, Eric again. Having said that, the dialogue in this uh, just like sort of comes to life much more easily than the mm. other one. Uh, the the Marquis does come across as very florid and sort of like, oh, this is how noble people speak. It doesn't matter. Um, he just very flowery and sort of like unimportant, uh, like sort of shallow even. Mm. Um, whereas sort of i seem to remember from the other one they, they both had very sort of stylized language in the other one um w w this one is actually a dialogue <laughs> yeah no i think i think that speaks to uh, elizabeth's enjoyment you know uh you know the, the 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 plot moves forward the the dialogue is is is, is very sharp there's some there are some really nicely turned lines there are some quotable lines there are this there's good comedy um it's just sort of it's it's attached to this plot um and this concept um and it's sort of we've we've had this again recently uh where you know we're, we we had a really entertaining play that was just unfortunately really horrible in terms of what it was trying to say um so you know these are these are you know, professional playwrights who know their onions, know what they're doing. They can put together a, the, 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 the ordering of events and, and create characters that, that, that pop off the page. Um, but yeah, what do you do when the sort of central conceit is just, you just don't buy? What do you do when you just don't buy the central conceit? Mm. Uh, answers on a postcard. Uh, <laughs> thoughts uh, in the comments. Um, what does one do with uh, a Grissel that is this patient? Uh, a little more impatience would be required. Um, <laughs> impatient Grissel. <laughs> um, maybe this is one, and we've spoken this about the the other version of uh, the uh, the earlier version. Is that uh, yeah? Uh, maybe this is one where you 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 need to have a. a a modern take version to go with it if you're going to stage it so that you've you've got a sort of counterpoint thing so that you you to justify its existence <laughs> because to just plonk it out there is um yeah a lot harder uh, anyway uh, any final final thoughts to throw in before we close uh, elizabeth i wanted to just give a shout out to emilo for being uh the one of the most verbose characters i've ever seen in a play in an early modern play um, and then I also wanted to talk about just briefly about this concept of like poverty and virtue and this concept of like being having goodness that stems from being beggarly and where that comes from. And then this concept of like the people who have wealth being wicked and having like ulterior motives. And I think that's come across quite well in the first third of the play. Hmm. Oh yes, no, I, I think there is there is something about wealth and 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 class that this this is this text is speaking to absolutely. Yeah. Um, Eric, were you waiting? Yeah, I was just going to say we had that play. I think it was um, knowledge. I can't remember what it was called, but it was all this thing about like uh, money without knowledge, without wit, wit, uh, wit without money, um, so on and so forth. There, there was this like very long names for characters that was basically sort of. I think all for money, maybe that 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 was the title. Uh, where it was this huge meditation on what happens to people when they get money, and it was just kind of like, well, yeah, pretty much. That's <laughs> no, it doesn't happen. Um, but it, it's if it, I feel this needs more, like sort of context for like you know, if, if you put it next to morality plays, this is practically comedy, almost. 
Um, but then, com- like the bad guys in morality plays are much more fun. Mm, yeah, I mean, if if the Marquis, that's the thing is, you don't know the Marquis isn't mustache twirly. If he was more mustache twirly, then maybe we'd take it easier. But the fact that he sort he, the way his dialogue is phrased and the way he sort of strides on stage, he, he's sort of striding on like he's the the comic hero here. Um, makes it really hard to take. Uh, whereas if he came on and went, I will do evil things, then uh, that might be, um... yeah. Okay, I've run out of train of thoughts. I see no one else uh, <laughs> waving. So all that remains is until the next time when we continue this journey into the second third of the play. All that remains is to thank all the wonderful readers for their wonderful reading. Thank you very much and goodbye, my brisk spangled baby. <laughs> 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 <laughs>